What if I told you that I was approached by a highly organized, undercover organization who has been assisting humanity behind the scenes for the last 5,000 years? And what if I told you that I was given a text that shares the hidden history of Earth, secrets of creation, and ways we can access supernatural abilities? A text that reveals human lifespans extending for hundreds of years. A text that shows technology that is far more advanced than we know of, that is being used today. A text that provides a blueprint for reaching humanity's highest potential. And what if I told you that this was one of many sacred texts that all point to the same historic events? For this reason, I have brought two of my good friends, Aaron Abke and Brandon Bozarth, who are both experts in the Law of One material and the Bashar material to show how these three separate bodies of work all point to the same fundamental truths. My name is Jason Shurka, and this is Hidden Revelations. Many sources, one truth. My name is Jason Shurka, and I'm your host for Hidden Revelations, an eight-part series that will focus on not only uncovering our hidden history of humanity, a history that can empower us beyond belief, but also showing how multiple different texts channeled and written through different points of history all actually say the same thing. They may be using different terminology, but they are saying the same thing. That's the goal of this show. That's the intention of this series. And all in all, my hope and our hope is to leave you all empowered and knowing the true power that you hold as a human being and beyond. So sitting to my left is Brandon Bozarth and sitting to my right is Aaron Abke, two very good friends of mine, experts in the law of one and an expert in the Bashar material, which we will show how that all connects to a text that I represent called the Pyramid Code. So before I go forward in explaining what we're going to be covering in this series, Brandon, why don't you introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Jason. So Bashar is an extraterrestrial, and he made contact with Daralanka about 38 years ago. And the story goes, and there's a whole documentary about this. Amazing story. That Yeah, he was driving in his car, and a ship in broad daylight appeared in front of him and led him kind of on like a wild goose chase with his family, right? With his family. I'm not sure if it was his family, but there were a few friends in a car. Yeah. There were other people in the car and the ship stops and he pulls up to the ship and the ship just shoots up into the sky and he Mm -hmm. he couldn't explain what happened. So he went to a, a channeling class, not to uh, intend to channel, but to get answers in the class in meditation. He had a remembrance of an agreement that he made on higher levels, which we're going to be talking about. Um, to channel Bashar. And he learned or he remembered that Bashar is an extraterrestrial 300 years in our future um, in a slightly different dimension or density than our density and is part of a society called the Esasani. So he honored the agreement to do the channeling in this lifetime. And since then, it's been 38 years of uh, 500 at least hours of channeled material, everything from uh, the physics of reality um, what it means to be ourselves, uh, the transformational principles of negative belief systems and transcending the ego, as well as ancient uh, timelines and forgotten history. So I've been studying that for about uh, the last eight years, and it's taken me eight years to understand that much of it. Um, and just from understanding this much of it, it's completely changed my life and become uh, foundational to the programs and the retreats that I facilitate around the world. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. Aaron, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience and just share a little bit about who you are and maybe a little bit more about the Law of One for those who are not familiar with the material itself. Yeah, my name is Aaron Abke, and most people know me as a Law of One teacher. I discovered the Law of One material uh, probably about four or five years ago. And the Law of One is a channel text from the 1980s, a group of three people who were actually UFO researchers. And they were in researching the UFO phenomenon, they started to discover somehow 
that if we really want to understand who these extraterrestrial beings are, we should probably be more interested in their philosophy and spirituality than their science and technology. And so they came up with the idea of trying to make contact through channeling. And so after I think the better part of a decade, uh, they finally made contact with an entity that identified itself as Ra, a social memory complex from the planet Venus from a few billion years ago. And most people consider the Law of One to be the most remarkable channeled text of all time, uh, myself definitely included. As far as I know, it's actually the only trance channeled text that's available. I could be wrong on that, but I think, you know, the Seth material, uh, Delor even Dolores Cannon's, Edgar Cayce's, uh, the Wingmakers, these are all um, sort of like Bashar, more lucid channeling. But in, in the Law of One, Carla Rukar, the channeler, was completely in a trance state, unconscious of anything that was taking place. And I think about 10 sessions or 20 sessions in, they asked, actually ask Ra, can we tell Carla what we're talking about? You know, the seven densities, the logos. So that's what kind of makes it stand out to me. And it's essentially just a metaphysical explanation of the nature of the universe, who we are, the science of reincarnation, and a lot of the ancient human timelines that we found so much synchronicity in. So I'm very excited to get into this and talk about where these texts and sources kind of meet up together. Thank you so much for sharing, Aaron. So I want to share a little bit about how this show came about. And it all starts with a story of something we all experienced together just a couple of months ago back in Colorado. So a few months ago, we met for the first time, the three of us with another friend of ours, Alex Zek. And we were in Colorado and we had a really long car ride. And throughout that car ride, both Aaron and Brandon asked, what's your story? You know, what, where do you come from? How'd you get to where you're at today? And I started filling them in on the Pyramid Code document, what that's all about. And they said, wow, you know, that sounds really interesting. I want to hear more about it. So I said, you know what, let's listen to the audiobook all together. And there's a three hour and, and change audiobook on YouTube that everybody can listen to. And I didn't tell them too much about it. I just said, let's listen to it all together. And throughout this multiple hour car ride all together, we were listening to this thing and a three hour audiobook took about 10 hours to get through because we kept pausing because mm -hmm. Aaron and Brandon both kept saying, wait a second, that connects to everything that I learned about Bashar and everything that I learned through the law of one. And there's so many synchronicities happening throughout these different texts. So that's where this show sort of came about. We saw all of these connections coming together and we said, wait a second, the law of one has a lot of people following it. Bashar has a lot of people following it. The pyramid code has a lot of people listening to it and just interested in the document itself. Why don't we make a show talking about how all of these different texts, although they use different terminology, are actually saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why we're sitting here today to do just that. Yeah, what, what I found was really profound was when you and I met, we did a collaboration on Instagram, a live, and I asked you how long you've been doing this, and you said about six months. And you had uh, something like 60K followers. And I was like, what do you mean you've been doing this for six months? Like, you can't gain that much following that, that short amount of time. And But I didn't think to ask you, like, what put you on the map, so to speak? So it was when we started talking about, you started sharing your story of how you came, you were given the pyramid code. And did everything you could to release it. And, and that's just an amazing story we'll get into. But when that document hit the map in the spiritual community, it instantly had a, a massive resonance with people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the views were up. You in, immediately got interviews with Gaia and all these different um, platforms. And to me, that speaks to the validity of the material in that, you know, the universe decides what has credibility based on how it resonates, I think. Mm, absolutely. So I would love for you to begin sharing with the audience how you first came in contact with TLS or really how they came in contact with you and then how they wound up giving you the pyramid code. Absolutely. So in June of 2018, I was approached by who I thought at the time was a stranger. And now I know he wasn't. He came to me with a certain agenda to reveal certain things over time and eventually bring me into something without me knowing what he was bringing me into at the time. And what started as a relationship of just me and a stranger ended up in an incredible friendship. And I really learned a lot over a period of, I would say, a period of really two years, which I was going through this disclosure process of speaking about, I mean, extraterrestrial life, high technology, ancient history, parts of history that aren't necessarily documented. And throughout this disclosure process, he told me more and more and more as I was able to receive certain information. 
And he kept referring to this organization. Now I know that organization is called TLS, or otherwise known as the Light System. But I didn't really understand what was going on at the time. I just knew that there was this incredible man that befriended me, and he was sharing incredible information, incredible experiences. But they were just experiences. It was just information. And I needed more to really understand. Now, yes, I was always interested in this. So it wasn't so hard to believe, but I needed more. I needed something tangible. I needed something that could give me the understanding that what's going on right now is absolutely real. So fast forward a couple of years to February 6th of 2020, just about a, two years ago at this point, almost. I was invited to a meeting now I know it was a TLS meeting. All I knew was I had to be at a certain place on February 6th at 6 p.m. I showed up, there was a dinner, a dinner turned into this meeting, started with about six of us at the dinner, turned into nine of us at the meeting, and this meeting lasted 12 hours. Now, throughout this meeting, I came to understand that this organization that I was being sort of briefed on was named TLS, otherwise known as the Light System. Now, before I go into what happened in that meeting with what I can share of what happened in that meeting, let me just cover who TLS is to give everybody a, a better understanding of what we're talking about here. TLS, the light system, is a physical organization. You can think about them as a form of like the spiritual version of the CIA. Physical organization, physical branches in every major city in the world, now approaching almost 8,000 initiated agents around the world. Some are very famous and very well-known people, whether they're celebrities, whether they're world leaders, whether they're uh, authors, producers, things of that sort. Most of the individuals that are initiated agents in TLS are not known. It could be your brother. It could be your sister. You would have absolutely no idea. It could idea. even be you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has a cover story. Everybody is paid under an alias. It's just like the CIA undercover. That's how it works. Now, what they do a little differently is I would say their intention. Mm. Their intention overall, why they exist, is to help humanity and guide humanity in reaching a higher level of awareness and consciousness. That's not to say that they take our freedom of choice away. So the art of what they figured out over the thousands of years that they've been in existence, over 5,000 years, by the way, is how to help and guide humanity in reaching a higher level of consciousness without sort of coming in our way of interfering with our freedom of choice, interfering with the conscious evolution of humanity. That's the art that they figured out over the past mm -hmm. few thousand years. And that's what I'm kind of learning over time as well. And my first question, and many people's question, by the way, was, well, if they have so much power, why don't they just wipe out all the bad people and bring us to this incredible destiny overnight? Mm -hmm. And that's a great question. And the answer that I've come to learn over time was the fact that this has nothing to do with our external reality. Our external reality is a reflection of our internal reality. In other words, the collective consciousness, as we all know, and as all of these texts really allude to, the collective consciousness is what causes our reality to exist in the way that it exists in the first place. And if they were to wipe out, and they can, if they were to wipe out certain individuals overnight, leaders oppressing and doing horrific things to humanity and children, many things around the world, well, what would stop those people from being replaced? And that's where the focus on the collective consciousness is so important. So do they do things to bring certain organizations down? Do they do things to stop the perpetration of very evil agendas? Absolutely. But the focus is on helping humanity reach a higher level of consciousness because in doing so, the darkness will dissolve in its entirety, foundationally speaking. Mm -hmm. And that's how we reach a permanent level of reaching our collective destiny as humanity as a whole. And you've mentioned, when you say they are able to stop these kind of events, you've mentioned technology and you've also mentioned uh, like consciousness technology. Yes. So without getting too off track, can you just mention now what that, like what are the means by which, what do they have access to that the average person does not? Absolutely. So they have a mix of physical technology and spiritual technology. Now, what I've learned and found really interesting is the fact that 
their spiritual technology and physical technology actually work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And as Aaron said, their physical technology is actually an interface in many cases for consciousness, mm -hmm. right? meaning conscious technology. So today we talk about technology being smartphones and computers and the ability to do an Instagram live and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now that's great, but the technology we're talking about here doesn't necessarily have to do with wires. You right, know, right. it does have to do with electricity, resonance, and frequency, mm -hmm. but it's more so tapping into the electricity that is inherent in the universe as a whole, tapping into that infinite vacuum of energy to begin with. Yeah. Right. So one of their forms of technology is something, it literally looks like a black rope that you would put on your arm. The Jews call it a religious object. TLS would use it as a sort of spiritual version of technology to be able to detect where certain booby traps are underground in underground tunnels around the world. That's part of what Ray does, by the way. So wow. when he goes and detects where electromagnetic laser pulsation traps are underground in this vast underground tunnel system, when they do some of their operations, they send him first with the tefillin, in some cases on both arms, to go and scan the tunnel, to go and see where these things are because it allows him to reach a higher level of awareness and consciousness. So now he knows where they are, so they know where not to go. So mm. nobody dies, nobody gets hurt. Wow. So that's a form of what I would call spiritual technology that's also physical, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have wires. It doesn't have microchips. It doesn't work that way. It's mm -hmm. completely foreign to our common understanding of what technology is. Mm -hmm. In other cases, they have other technology that works and what free technology would work through, which are actual boxes mm -hmm. through free technology, connecting to that vacuum of space and time mm -hmm. to be able to tap into that vacuum of infinite and eternal yeah. energy. Wow. An interesting distinction I see here is that most people in the spiritual community are familiar with the Illuminati or the, the cabal, the deep state, and are aware of the fact that these sort of globalists control at this point, basically every major institution form of technology there is and use it for the purpose of control and enslavement. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the technology that comes from the Illuminati is, is meant to enslave consciousness, suppress consciousness, you know, enslaving us to devices and social media platforms and disconnecting us. And TLS, I think might be accurate to say is sort of the light version of the Illuminati. Their, their use of technology is to expand and liberate consciousness. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. But I do want to emphasize the fact that they are not our saviors. Nobody's mm -hmm. our savior. Right. No organization is our savior. We save ourselves. They just help empower us to realize the fact that we can actually save ourselves. Yes. Because that's the end all be all. So they do things to help along the way. It could be anywhere from literally producing a movie, which they do, by the way, mm -hmm. and instilling subliminal messages into that movie to sort of instill this idea into our heads of, whoa, mm -hmm. whoa a human being can maybe do that. Which is know? the same thing that the Illum Illuminati does with propaganda. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Absolutely. So you can say the strategies in many ways are universal. The intentions mm -hmm. are where we hold two completely different sides of right. the coin. The intentions of the Illuminati and organizations of that nature would be to suppress, oppress, and enslave. Whereas the intentions of TLS, the light system organization, other organizations that do the same thing, by the way, would be to empower, take us out of that enslavement and show us that we have the power to reach an infinite potential that's within each and every one of us, regardless of race, regardless of age, regardless of religion, regardless of gender, regardless of any of that. And TLS has nothing to do with that. So you'll find a Jew, a Muslim, a Christian, an atheist, a Buddhist, all of these people all in one, generally not so much atheists, because there is an understanding that there is a, a creator of some sort. Mm -hmm. And even atheists do say the Big Bang did it. So there is a creation yeah. idea in that. Right. But the terminology is a little different. Yeah. That's what I found to be so synchronistic with the Law of One material initially is that Law of One explains the polarities in consciousness, the positive and the negative. They define it as the service to self path, the negative, and the service to others path, the positive. And on the service to others path, they polarize by honoring and helping and protecting free will, mm -hmm. whereas the negative service to self polarity polarizes negatively by controlling, oppressing, and, and manipulating free will. So in a sense, both polarities are using free will as kind of like the nectar. Absolutely. It's the source of how they mm -hmm. polarize, but both of them have to sway free will 
to their own direction. It has to be given freely. Yes. Like the negative path, they can't just put us in in chains and throw us in a jail cell and polarize. Absolutely. We they have to to coerce us into giving over our free will through the suppression and control of consciousness. So that's why TLS won't just go take these people out because we've collectively, in a sense, agreed to these forms of enslavement by allowing them and not saying no to them. Mm-hmm. And so until we say no collectively, why would they go make that decision on our behalf? Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and Jason, you said they're not our savior and uh, echoed in the Bashar material and in the law of one is that same approach which says, and it's even in Star Trek, as it's called the prime directive. So anytime a higher intelligence, and Bashar shared this as well, a higher intelligence, um, which there are individuals in TLS that fundamentally have a higher intelligence and mm-hmm. understanding of the nature of reality. If they interfere in the natural evolution of, uh, of a species, they're violating what's called the prime directive, which mm-hmm. actually was... Uh, originally in Star Trek, but Bashar confirmed that's actually a universal principle that higher intelligence follows. And mm-hmm. so just to speak to how the positive path, including TLS, is creating or facilitating empowerment, it has to be, they will meet us for what we're ready for. Absolutely. In, a sense, in a sense, they will not hold back from us. They will respond to where we are. They will, we have to meet them halfway in a sense. Yeah. They Absolutely. offer, we have to grasp the baton. Exactly. Huge, yeah. huge. And that has to do with the collective in many cases. Yeah. And our own personal responsibility, yeah. which is really what a big part of this show is about. Yeah. yeah. So you're in this meeting, something out of the matrix. <laughs> and um, how, how did the pyramid code come about? So yeah, that meeting was on February 6th of 2020, and it gave me absolutely everything that I needed to validate everything that I've been taught, experienced, and shown over the past two and a half years leading up to that meeting. So the leader of the meeting, his name is Rabbi A.A. And again, this has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with race. Just like one of the leaders is a Jew and is a rabbi, there's another one that's Japanese, has nothing to do with Judaism. So nothing to do with religion or race. That's just what their destiny brought them to in this reincarnation. Mm -hmm. So Rabbi AA instructed Ray to document what is now called the Pyramid Code. In Hebrew, it's called Torah HaPiramida, which actually is translated to the Pyramid Bible. Wow. But we translated Mm -hmm. it to the Pyramid Code in English to make it sort of more comprehensible. Mm. Less religious into, sounding. Yeah, definitely less religious sounding and, and more understandable into what's being released in this document because mm. embedded within the document is an actual code that's encoded and encrypted within it in terms of the way it was written in the original Hebrew form. And it was written in Hebrew. I mean, it could be written in English also with code, but number one, Ray knows how to write in Hebrew with code. His native language also happens to be Hebrew. So he wrote it in Hebrew. Anyways, throughout that meeting, he was also told that this document, the Pyramid Code, was to be given to everybody in the meeting when it's done being written. The meeting ended, my life changed. I broke down a few times just from being overwhelmed because of what I went through throughout that 12 hour period. And just me understanding, connecting the dots of what just happened over the past two and a half years without me understanding what was happening. Yeah. And now everything started making more and more sense. So Jason, real quick, yeah, I just got to know. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> you might not be able to answer this because sure. a lot of our times hanging out together, you go, I can't answer that. It makes me more <laughs> excited. Were there supernatural experiences in that event, or in that meeting? Yes. That. Well, there you go. Yes, and, and that what, confirmed what you had. Yeah, was that was that what was overwhelming? Was it what you actually not just the not the information? Necessarily. No, no, I'm no. sure there was something. It wasn't you were just like, information. It was right. information coupled with experiences, coupled with me seeing certain things. Right. It changed my life from beginning to end. It validated everything. Unfortunately, and these are just my instructions. I can't go into in depth detail okay. about certain things that happened in that meeting. I guess it's just the nature of how the organization works. I yeah. know a lot of it works in secrecy which is another thing we're going to be speaking about throughout this series, the idea of secrecy and freedom of choice and how that whole thing works. But yes, that meeting changed my life. It showed me certain things. And I would say the majority of that meeting was supernatural in terms of what was occurring throughout that 12 hour period. Part of what TLS does as well is to become aware of massive world events and, you know, moves on the chessboard that, you know, the, the deep state is doing. And in some cases when it's, um, not an infringement of free will to prevent those things or at mm-hmm. least 
spread some awareness so that the collective can stand up and oppose those things, right? So were some of the things discussed in that meeting, a lot of the world events we're seeing happen now? Some of the meeting was focused on current events, but I would say the majority of the meeting was focused on giving me and others at that meeting instructions on certain things that we can do to reach certain points. Mm -hmm. And specifically when it came to me, something, and I would say a major, major event that I personally have to prepare for that is expected to happen, having to do with things that I can't necessarily disclose here or to anybody at this point other than the individuals at that meeting, but I could tell you that it's a, a major event that, let's put it this way, if that does happen, and I'm under the assumption that that will happen because that's part of what I'm preparing for and going through in preparation for right now, will mm. change the world drastically. Big picture, it will be a world event. In a positive direction. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're given the pyramid code. What is that? It's a document that talks about Ray's first incarnation. Notice I say incarnation, not reincarnation, mm -hmm. because it was the first time he came into physical form as a soul. Mm -hmm. In the year 2448, according to the Hebrew calendar, around the year 1312 BC, according to the Gregorian calendar. In that time, he gives a major in-depth memory of his life back in ancient Egypt. What happened back then? Who built the pyramids? How they built the pyramids? Why they built the pyramids? The purposes, the functions, the intentions. In some cases, what went wrong mm. on that timeline? Mm. What the intentions were to happen from certain races that came here to do what they did and what ended up happening, which we will speak about in this series as well. Mm. But overall, it's a, it's a mix. This document is a mix of a very in-depth memory of a past incarnation, one of which I was in, by the way, that's why I was a part of this document, coupled with the Pyramid Code, which is an actual chapter in this document, which tells you all about the pyramids, their purposes, their functions, how they built them, why they built them, and many, many in-depth things that I've personally never heard of in other places, having to do with pyramids being crafts, extraterrestrial crafts, UFOs, how they communicate with motherships and other planets, and the technology that was used back then and is now being used today, only it's in the hands of individuals that it should not be in the hands right. of. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's surfacing today. So this document is given to me now in June. I'm reading it. It's in Hebrew. I'm having a hard time reading it because I know a little bit, but I wasn't proficient in Hebrew at the time, and I'm still learning now. So I'm given this thing. I was given a lot of help to translate it. I'm reading it, and I'm blown away. I'm like, wait a second. This has to go out to the world. How do we get it out to the world? Now, I was originally under the assumption that this thing had to be kept confidential. And I understood that TLS actually wanted Ray to put it out. And Ray being who he is, being undercover, having an incredible cover in the world, he doesn't want his life to change. He doesn't want to come out. And mm -hmm. right now, he's known for who he is, which is not working for TLS whatsoever in the public eye. Mm -hmm. And for him to come out, he also comes from a background like I come from. He would come out of a place of everybody thinking he's crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, ever he doesn't want to deal with it. Didn't you say that a lot of people in the business world, at least in his niche of business, might even know who Ray is? Yeah, absolutely. So he has a lot to lose by coming out publicly with this text. In his eyes. I don't agree that it's a lot to lose, but that's right. his way of seeing it. Mm -hmm. I respect him for seeing it that way. He just way. doesn't want all the attention. He doesn't want the attention. He doesn't want to deal with it. I understand it. I respect it. I don't necessarily agree with it, but I will say that. I don't know everything he's been through. Right. So I can't even speak on his behalf because I don't know what I would do in his shoes mm -hmm. after everything he's gone through. Mm -hmm. So the fact of the matter is that's what's going on, right? That's where he's at. I have to respect it. But I do want this document to come out. So how do we get it out? And I'm convincing and persuading and trying to show him why this has to come out. Let's figure out a way to get it out. He comes back to me after a couple of weeks and he says, all right, listen, you want to put this document out? No problem. You're going to put it out under your name. You're going to publish it. You're going to take my name out of it, him being Ray. So now it says written by anonymous. And again, mind you, Ray is not his real name. Ray is an anonymous name to preserve his anonymity. So he says, you're going to put this out. You're going to take my name out of it. It says written by anonymous. You're going to take everybody else's name that appears in that document out of it. So nobody can trace it back to him and you're going to publish it. And the only names you're going to keep in that document as the names that they actually are, are yours, mine, as Jason Sherka, and the rabbi, Rabbi AA, which was, by the way, the first time that the rabbi's full name was written 
and publicized. His name is Rabbi Eliezer Alfrandi. Now in English, it's E-A, but in Hebrew, Eliezer is spelled with an Aleph. And his last name, Alfrandi, is spelled with an Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Mm. So Rabbi Aleph Aleph translates to Rabbi A-A oh. in English. That's why it's Rabbi A-A, just so to, to make that clear. Mm. So the first thing I said was no problem. I'm in, I'm going to publish this thing. Now, I didn't understand that what I just agreed to was pretty much agreeing to saying, I'm going to represent yeah. an organization that has more power than I can begin to even comprehend, yeah. that's been around for over 5,000 years, that works with extraterrestrial life in physical form, that has technology that can bring you around the universe and around the corner 10 times in one second. <laughs> you know, things that we can't even begin to comprehend. Yeah. Suddenly I'm sitting here in my early 20s understanding that not only was I given the opportunity to do that, but I also agreed. You're the chosen one. I'm not the chosen one. <laughs> you are the one. <laughs> I'm definitely not the chosen one. But And TLS has never been no, made known publicly before. Never. Before this, this is the text. first time. In 5,000 years. This is the first time TLS is now coming out and saying we exist. So that says a lot about now, where we are. Yes. But my question was, why the hell are you coming to me? Yeah. Who, why Jason? Who am I? You know, I'm, I mean, mind you what I've done in my teenage years growing up, I'm no saint whatsoever, <laughs> you know, at all. Neither is Ray, right? <laughs> but why are you coming to me? You know, well, I'm in real estate. I'm in business. I have nothing to do with this. Why me? Mm -hmm. And I never really had a clear answer, but the two answers that they gave me was when you read Rays of Light, you will come to understand. Rays of Light is another document that I'm now trying to push Ray to put out in its entirety. We got certain portions of it out, but I hope to get the entirety of the publication of that book out. It was written between 2010 and 2014. The other answer that I was always given was you were born with something. You will come to understand what that something is. So here I am not understanding what the hell they want for my life. All I know is I agreed to this. I know that this organization is absolutely incredible in terms of what they do. Their intentions are absolutely divine. And I now have the opportunity to stand behind them and say, I'm going to put out this document. The first thing I did naturally was say, okay, you guys have all the power in the world. Give me everybody in the press. You know, I don't, I don't know anybody. Give me everybody in the press. Let me do it. And they said, no, you're on your own. And it really pissed me off. It really frustrated me. I said, what do you mean I'm on my own? You guys have it. You can put me on the news tomorrow. Why, why aren't you doing that? They Typical said, guru fashion. Not that they you're are, on yeah. your own. Yeah. And I sat down for weeks. I didn't sleep. I made a database of everybody I had to reach out to. And I said, I'm going to get this document out, but I'm going to do it big. I'm not doing it, just putting it out. I'm going to do it big. I want to have a good impression for the first opportunity this incredible organization has given. I didn't sleep. Put names and lists and emails and numbers. And I made phone call and email after email, phone call after phone call. One thing led to another. I landed an interview with George Nouri on Coast to Coast AM, August 26th. Now, I came to understand that TLS actually had some sort of part in making that date come to fruition. And for those of you who read the Pyramid Code, you'll understand that 826 is very relevant in the date as a whole. I speak on the radio for the first time ever speaking about them for the first time ever, freaking out before this interview because I'm actually understanding at least a sliver of what I just agreed to. And I'll never forget the, the interview was from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. Eastern time because it's an overnight a.m. radio show. And at 2.30, I mean, I couldn't sleep the night before the, the radio show. 2.30 a.m., I go out on the patio and I look up and I say, God, if you're with me, just give me something. Give me a sign. Now, I live in New York. There aren't so many stars. Seeing a shooting star doesn't happen very often here. It's, it's actually very, very rare to, sh to see a shooting star with all the light pollution that we have. And the second I said, God, please give me a sign. Show me that you're with me. Give me some support because I'm freaking out. From one side of the horizon of the night sky all the way to the other, there was the biggest, brightest, shooting star or craft, whatever you want to call it, that flew from one side all the way to the other. And at that point, I felt the presence of God in my heart. And I said, all right. I started crying. I broke down. And I said, I'm in. I got this. And that experience in and of itself gave me everything that I needed mm -hmm. to move forward. Absolutely wow. every ounce of strength to get on that call and do it. August 26th, 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. I'm speaking to George Nouri. 
on the radio with all the strength in my heart, knowing that I have all the support right in me and right by my side to go through this. And it went incredible. And I was instructed to publish the Pyramid Code document on September 9th at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Comes that date and time. I click publish for free on jasonshirka.com for anybody to download, anybody to share, anybody to read. And it reached every continent in a matter of three hours with the exception of Antarctica. Wow. All around the world. That's incredible. Wow. And I was in shock. And I knew that this had nothing to do with me. Yeah. I knew that I was just a tool being used to do something. Ray mm -hmm. didn't want to do it. I came in. I was given that opportunity. I don't know. Maybe I was meant to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe it wasn't Ray's job. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I don't care. All I know is this document comes out. People around the world started reaching out in terms of how it changed their life and the resonance that they felt while reading it activated millions around mm -hmm. the world. And that's why we're sitting here today. Yeah. And now the Pyramid Code is considered, based on its connection to all these other documents out there, as a text that's been connected and validated from all these other documents out there. From the second it was published, producers from all around the world, from Gaia and other TV shows and producers that have made incredible movies with big actors started reaching out. And they're like, we wanna make a documentary, we wanna make a movie, we wanna make a film, we wanna do this. And everything was happening so fast, but I accepted it. I accepted it because I knew that that's what I stepped into. Mm -hmm. And and what now, a year later, we're sitting here with Aaron Abke, expert of the law of one, Brandon Bozarth, expert of the Bashar material. Just two months ago, we sat down in the car all together, understanding that all of these materials say the same exact thing. And that's why we're sitting here today to show you all how all of these materials, regardless of the identification of terminology that's used, are saying the same exact thing. And when we lose the terminology, when we lose our identification with the terminology that we've been taught through, we come to understand that we are all one, not just in principle and reality. It's all saying the same thing. And that's what we all aim to show you throughout this eight episode series. So in this eight episode series, Hidden Revelations, with this being episode one, explaining our origin stories, how this series came to fruition in the first place, we will be speaking about a wide array of different things that actually connect to one another, connecting the dots between all. Episode two will cover forgotten history, explaining the forgotten history, the undocumented history, that in many cases, by the way, was taken out of our textbooks to disempower humanity. Our goal is to bring it back into our remembrance to empower each and every one of us and show us where we once were to now show us where we could actually go. Episode three is called Secrecy and the Freedom of Choice, where we will be dissolving the idea of secrecy as this malicious thing and explaining why secrecy is actually something used in many cases and how it's been used in history and in present times to preserve the freedom of choice. We will then expand on why the freedom of choice is something that must be preserved to help us reach our collective destiny as a human collective as a whole. In episode four of Normalizing the Supernatural, we will show you why and how the supernatural is actually very natural. Episode five is called, What About God? In which we will be talking about the idea of God. We'll be dissolving the idea that God is this entity in the clouds that punishes us when we sin and do something wrong. And God may actually be an awareness, a consciousness. And that consciousness, that awareness is actually a part of each and every one of us. Now the question is, how do we access it? How do we reach it? How do we embody it? Episode six is called Spiritual Technology, where we will completely reframe our definition of technology, our understanding of technology, from being this thing of cameras and phones and computers to actually understanding that technology doesn't need wires to work, doesn't need a screen to work, but where physical technology but actually understanding that physical technology is actually and can be used as an interface for consciousness, otherwise known as spiritual technology. We will be giving examples of how that was used in history, 
and how that's being used in present day today and how we can actually use that spiritual technology through words, through language, through divine language, through codes, through numerology and understanding how numerology actually connects to the divine languages that in many cases are being lost in present day. Really excited for that conversation. It's going to be incredible. Yeah. Episode seven is called, Where is the Proof? And that's one of the biggest questions. You know, you see many people speaking about extraterrestrial life, incredible organizations like the light system, like TLS, many things that sound unbelievable to the common man. And the question is always, where is the proof? Where is the proof of levitation? Where is the proof of these supernatural abilities that we all speak about, but can't necessarily prove? In this episode, we will be speaking about what proof actually is. Is there really such thing as indefinite proof? And do we have to raise to a higher level of consciousness and awareness to be able to see certain things, both physically and spiritually? And lastly, episode eight is called A New Age. A new age of consciousness, a new age of humanity. We will show that the only difference between modern day religion and new age darkness and the whole demonic idea behind it is not a reality, but really a fight and a debate over terminology and the identification with that terminology. Mm -hmm. We will show how when we dissolve the identification with that terminology, we are all saying the same thing. And ultimately, by dissolving that identification, we will bring ourselves into a new age. Call it bliss, call it nirvana, call it the days of the Messiah, call it the second coming of Jesus. We are all saying the same thing with a different story, with a different identity. We will dissolve these identities, not to take anybody away from their story, but just to help everybody understand how your story connects to everybody else's. Hmm. So we invite you to join us on this journey, an eight-part series where we will discuss many sources that all lead to the same truth. I'm your host, Jason Sherka. I'm Brandon Bozarth. I'm Aaron Apke. And this is Hidden Revelations. Many sources, one truth. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in episode two as we discuss the forgotten history of humanity.